uh, we are up to the next presentation, same format, uh, 20 minutes discussion, then, then until 20 past the hour, uh, sorry, 20 minute presentation, and until 20 minutes past the hour discussion, uh, seeking to both understand the proposal and uh, uh, find the actionable follow-ups. And uh, this next paper is on Sigma protocols by uh, Stefan Kerr and uh, Michelle Oru. Uh, Michelle will present. Go ahead, please. Yeah, hello. Um, so <laughs> this talk is going to be uh, probably a bit different from uh, the previous one and also the one of last year, um, because I'm not really going to explain a new proof system. I'm going to explain something about one that is like 30 years old. Um, but hopefully with this presentation, I will uh, convince you that uh, Sigma protocol should be uh, one of the first output of this uh, community effort and, um, and that it's not a simple task. Um, and hopefully with this talk, we can together decide the limits of the proposal and work together on separate points. Um, this is joint work with Stefan, who is also here in the call. Um, so uh, Sigma protocols are like uh, fine 90s of vintage crypto, well-aged, and um, I'm not going to explain them. Uh, during this talk, I'm going to assume that you already know at least what are Schnorr proofs. Um, this is because I don't want to end up explaining Sigma protocols to the very same people that explained them to me a, a couple of years ago, uh, but I'm going to fix the notation. I'm going to select T for the commitment, C for the challenge, and S for the response. Okay, so Sigma protocols have these uh, three messages that generally satisfy uh, some security properties. Special soundness, meaning that uh, given a couple of transcripts, I can recover the witness. These uh, uh, protects the verifier in a sense. And honest verifier, zero knowledge, which uh, says that as long as the verifier is honest, no information whatsoever about the witness is being leaked, besides that it belongs to the relation. Um, this, in a, in a sense, protects the prover instead. Um, now, already, these security properties that are proper of Sigma protocols are off from the usual security notions that we generally give in, uh, I don't know, SNARKs. And they are even stronger than some other security notion like witness extended emulation that we give, uh, for instance, in IP protocols. And concretely, something like honest verifiers in knowledge really means nothing in terms of security. We cannot expect the verifier to just send a random C and that is from the correct distribution. Um, so what I hope to do now is going around to those issue. Uh, but first I want to restrict the class of Sigma protocols that we, I would like to be standardized. First, um, I know that there are Sigma protocols for composite group, RSA moduli, there are even variants from in based on lattices. Um, but by far, I think that the most relevant thing for now would be to focus on uh, prime fields uh, because it's easier, because it's what the most applications are used in and we, what is what we are dealing with anyway. Um, if you think that uh, doing this restriction, I'm missing anything, uh, please write it down and uh, at the end of the talk, there will be an entire slide just for this. Um, so what it, does it mean to restrict to, um, um, to prime fields? I'm going to consider a group homomorphism phi that grows from a vector space over a field, a prime field, into a group, okay? And now the sigma protocol that I'm focused on is um, a sigma protocol where T, the commitment, is an image of this homomorphism C is selected uniformly a random format challenger. It's like uh, an integer that is very small, even 128 bits. And the response uh, S will be in the, in the field, in the vector space, okay? So for instance, the basic protocol for proving uh, knowledge of a pre-image that I wrote in here as uh, in Kamenisch-Stadler notation, which uh, if not canonical, it's at least uh, the conventional way of expressing relations for Sigma protocols. I'm saying that uh, I know a W such that uh, Y is the image of uh, W under C. And um, um, what I would do to, to do that, I would pick a random R, send uh, the image under C, get the challenge uniformly random, and then uh, output a response that satisfies the verification equation, which is at the bottom right. So these are the kind of protocols that we would be working on. And uh, why am I doing this? Because again, these are the protocols that I want to capture. These are the protocols that uh, are used in practice, like, uh, I don't know, Okamoto Schnorr signatures, the LEQ proofs. These are all in here. Um, 
if you are more of a coder and you don't know what, uh, what a group homomorphism is, for instance, just think of it as a scalar multiplication. So replace uh, C with a multiplication by the generator, and then you uh, just obtain proof of knowledge of a discrete law. So this is a standard Schnorr proof uh, that uh, you should be familiar with. And um, the same is uh, if I, instead of uh, doing a scalar multiplication, I multiply by a vector of elements, then I end up with uh, what uh, are called uh, DLAQ proofs. They are used in Brave, in Privacy Pass, and, um, and this is just by replacing the, the function. Oh, sorry, I didn't okay. hear what kind of proofs that was. These are DLEQ proofs. These are, these are like the VOPRF stuff. Okay. So, um, yeah, so this is the first restriction that I'm going to put. The second restriction that I would like to pose is uh, non interactivity. Um, what does it mean? Why do we want to do this um, concretely? Um, I mean, it means that we're going to apply the Fiesha Mir transform and compute the challenge as the hash of the commitment. Now, this protocol. Um, via the forking lemma as a knowledge soundness, and it is also zero knowledge. I know that there are other ways, multiple ways for achieving zero knowledge in Sigma protocols, but this one specifically preserves the same nice structure and is definitely the more efficient. Also, we get one pair for free, which are signatures, if we just append the message to the hash function, which could be also a possible outcome of the standardization. So now the prover, it will be a single al algorithm, no interaction with a verifier because the challenge will, will be computed by itself and will be guaranteed to be from the correct distribution by the hash function. Then the verifier give out the protocol transcript. What is the protocol transcript? The commitment, the challenge, and the response. We'll check the verification equation and that the hash is computed correctly. Now, despite this protocol is uh, uh, formally secure in the sense that it's knowledge sound and zero knowledge, um, this is far from what we should deploy in practice. Um, does anybody know why this, uh, this is not uh, secure? Why you wouldn't deploy this in practice? Um, do you have to hash the instance as well as T? Yeah, exactly. Um, Exactly, there are multiple problems with this. One is that uh, we didn't hash the statement together with it. And um, so there is more, more work that needs to be done here. And um, I guess one of the points of this standard is really about clarifying these points for everybody and, um, and decide on them together. Okay, so um, Sigma protocols have some properties that we also treat in the, in the submission. Um, these are what we, I'm going to call extensions. Um, these extensions are relatively straightforward and there are plenty of resources for them online, even textbooks like Bonne Um So one possible way, um, one kind of relation that are supported by Sigma protocols are linear relations. I can prove that I know a witness that, that, that is a solution to a linear system of equation. Or composition. I can prove, for instance, that uh, I know a witness that is the discrete log of either y0 or y1. And uh, this protocol can be stuck together. Um, so for instance, or composition can be used for, or, for ring signatures or uh, even for very small confidential transactions. Um, and composition um, is another way of composing sigma protocols and uh, can, for instance, say simultaneously that they know a witness for y0 and a witness for y1, at the same, all with uh, only three messages. Um, this can be used, for instance, for proving knowledge of an encrypted message. Now, I'm not going to explain those, uh, but uh, there are uh, there is at least one even of the zero knowledge events that uh, that will tell you everything about them if you have questions. Um, so now that we have all these structures, all these uh, restrictions, and we are up above this building, uh, this ancient building, I'm going to go down and explain each one of the messages and the challenges in putting in practice each of these messages. I'm going to assume so that there is a, a function for each of the three separate messages that compose a Sigma protocol and, um, and analyze them separately. So there will be three points to tackle, okay? Um, so actually there are four uh, because it's even harder than these. Um, 
if the point of all what we are doing is to design a standard, then we also must come up with uh, uh, concrete curves that where this can be done. At least we want to end up like Monero. Um, I'm particularly skeptic about Sigma protocols because there are simultaneously other standards like uh, AD truth 519 where are very similar to which are very similar to Sigma protocols, but they are in composite order groups and uh, the, co the cofactor is absorbed in the verification equation. And my fear is that uh, people would uh, try to do the same in the, in the area Sigma protocols. And for this reason, I think we really should uh, support a limited set of curves with this. I, I mean, I guess you can use Ristretto if you have a, um, a composite order curve. Exactly, exactly. And uh, as uh, Dara said, um, we, we must choose the group and uh, Ristretto is a valid choice. I think we should focus on basically three targets. Um, one prime order curves like uh, sec P or sec K, basically I'm, I'm looking at NIST and Certicon. Um, and the second thing would be prime order group abstractions. So like the restrict or decaf would be valid choices. Um, finally, I would like also to have feedback on uh, pairing friendly groups. Why pairing friendly groups? Because I think people could easily prove knowledge of uh, a valid proof. And um, actually tomorrow there will be a talk about proofs of proofs by Nick and uh, you definitely shouldn't miss it. Um, but uh, I think this could be an interesting application. Um, there does um, considering pairing friendly groups basically restrict you to either BN curves or curves with very low row? Um, because otherwise you don't have a prime order group. So so using BLS12, then that's, it's not close to prime order. Right, but on the, on the top of that, you could make, uh, yeah, I don't know if we could make a, a prime group abstraction on the top of it. It could uh, work easily. Carry that's, on. Uh, that's, that's definitely a good point. Um, um, another thing over here is that uh, I would like to know if there are applications where proof cycles are used and uh, and whether these could be also interesting on that uh, on that side. Um, I think. Uh, the two could be valuable for inclusion, but like maybe with a big warning, like no cryptanalysis, uh, not much cryptanalysis on the cycles, of course. Um, but I think it's valuable for a standard. Um, okay. Um, so now the first element is the commitment. And I said the commitment you um, is the image of, uh, of some R. Now, how do you select the R? How do you get the entropy? Um, so for the basic protocol in general, you would take uh, R to be, you would select R to be random. The problem is that even a small bias in the distribution would be fatal for security. This is what happened to Sony. Um, so there are two different ways in which you can, uh, we can solve this. Either we are very lucky and we hope to have high quality entropy and uh, maybe you even hash it before, but um, at the end you have uh, some entropy that you can use for the commitment as long as you trust the entropy source. Um, there is another way, um, which was uh, proposed by Thomas Pornon for in the case of uh, DSA, which consists in creating uh, synthetic nonce by literally just hashing um, the witness together with the statement. It's a, a bit more complicated than this, but the core idea is uh, really producing entropy from the entropy of the witness. And um, the problem of this is that despite it has some nice property, like uh, you would end up with a deterministic prover, it is incompatible with our composition. And uh, it is incompatible with our composition because if I am making a ring signature where I know only one of two keys and I generate the commitment with a key that I know the secret of, then I would break anonymity if uh, an observer could uh, look at the two simultaneously. And so um, there is some thought process that needs to be put in this. Um, it could be, we could envision to set a state and have a counter that gets incremented every time. Um, but definitely there is some, uh, even political, I would say, some political decision that needs to be taken here, some stand that we must take on, uh, on which one of the two should be used to generate a commitment. Um, so in, in the, ex the extension, um, extension like OR and, and linear relations behave pretty much in, uh, nicely with respect to how we select the commitment. Um, in the OR proof, um, you simulate it so you don't care. 
um, in the context of uh, linear relations, you have to select the randomness such that it satisfies the linear system of equation. So there is some constraint there to, to think about. So finally, the challenge, um, how do you compute it properly? Um, in papers, we just see the hash of the commitment and this has caused a lot of problems, uh, for instance, of uh, alias. Um, the voting system uh, used by ICR. <laughs> and um, so how do you compute it properly? Let's, uh, let's go through this uh, once and for all. Um, in the, you hash the commitment, then you add the, the statement because you want to avoid uh, related key attacks. And by the way, this also gives us a strong property of soundness called simulation extractability. Then you put the, ground, the, <laughs> you put the generators um, again, to avoid attacks like the one that happened on Helios. Then you put the curve because you went, want to make sure you are really using the right parameters to avoid invalid curve attacks. And then you put a domain separator to avoid applications uh, from attackers that uh, recycle the proof between different applications. Um, but this is unfortunately not all because there are a bunch of problems again. First, you, you cannot just hash with a comma. You cannot just like... Uh, put in the hash, all these values like that, uh, because there are length test extension attacks. Um, and secondly, um, the output of the hash function must be, uh, is an integer, but at the end, there are only p elements that this value can take. Um, so there are three different ways in which I think we can, uh, the standard could go. Um, the first one that I very eloquently named uh, chof of at uh, 256 bits, is, uh, is literally what it is. Like uh, you take enough randomness, you reduce modulo P, and then you do scalar multiplication. And I'm thinking modulo P because the implementation, when you multiply, you're not multiplying by an integer. Generally, you um, the interface, the API, thinks in terms of modulo P. Um, um, so this possibility um, could lead to bias in the output distribution because the modulo is not exactly true to the end. Uh, but mean entropy, why we, was, we would lose at most one bit of security. There is another possibility, which is the one that has been taken by the standard for hashing into the curve, the IATF. Um, and it's uh, to ask more bits in such a way that the statistical distance between random bits, reduced modulo P and uniformly modulo P, this statistical distance is negligible. There is another possibility, which is a, uh, what is used, uh, which was proposed by Mike Hamburg in Strobe as an example, and is also what's been used in uh, ZKP from Henry. Um, that is about uh, adopting a sponge function and uh, constructing it in such a way that uh, all these ashes can compose up together nicely. Um, the problem is that I fear that if we switch to this solution, then a sponge function, uh, then we would be tied to sponge function. We cannot support other kind of ash functions. And also, I'm not sure that bringing up all this strobe um, uh, stack is, not, is, a, is a good idea when we have only one challenge to compute. So um, I think, for instance, that one possible ash function to consider would be um, algebraic ash functions, which could, be, um, could lead to more efficient uh, implementation in the case that we are using recursion. We're proving statements about uh, sigma protocols. Um, there are other options. Um, for instance, there was a Bitcoin enhancement proposal, improvement proposal, a BIP, um, 03040. Um, but uh, the bottom line is that we need to choose between these three things, at least for, uh, for what I know, for what I've seen. And, uh, and, uh, and for this, I really would like to, uh, to have feedback on, if, if you know more. Um, so um, finally, the response, um, there is no, no need to send the entire proof transcript. So when you, when you do a Sigma protocol non-interactively, um, you're not going to return a commitment challenge and response. Why? Because commitment or challenge can be derived from the verification equation. So we can um, choose between two forms what I call the short form, so commitment and response, and what I call the batchable form, so the commitment and the response. The nice thing about the short form is that there is no point validation. You just use it straight away and you check the verification equation. 
batchable form instead require might require validation depending on the curve that you're using and um, but it allows for batching um, what does it mean batching it means that if you get a um, bunch of statements where uh, parts of them are the same then we can take a linear combination and uh, by associativity do one scalar multiplication for the whole pack um, these uh, two possible outputs could be as well adopted um, simultaneously, like we can say uh, return short form or return batchable form. And this is also what's being used in other implementations of Sigma protocols, again, like ZKP, or also what's being proposed by Bitcoin uh, in the context of, of short signatures. Um, so in the paper, we also uh, listed the implementation that we are aware of that are already there. And um, we're certainly missing something. Um, we also try to list the features, features available. But if you if you know more implementations, even that are like inside another project, um, please write down them in the chat. And um, I'm also going to give you a second if you want to talk about them. Um, well, because I what would do be, what do yeah. int and fs um, mean in that? Yeah, sorry. Oh. Um, and composition or composition interactive supports for interactive Sigma protocol, and the FES means uh, fierce Shamir transform is supported. I see, okay. Um, yeah, sorry, I should explain that. Um, so, I mean, I, I care particularly about zero knowledge proofs. I think uh, signatures are, uh, are, are a totally different beast at this point. Um, so yeah, um, I'm looking forward, I see 27 messages, but I'm not going to look them now. Um, Okay, so um, now that we chatted for a bit about how to construct them, um, I would like to sort of set off the limits and uh, like the constraints on when should we use them. Um, I think they are perfectly fine for uh, small statements like the DH tuple or the LEQ, and they're even used in practice. I mentioned already privacy pass, they're using algebraic max and signal, and uh, there are literally tons of conference papers in applied security that are mentioning them and could potentially be using them in reality. Um, um, however, there are, for like longer statements, there are other proof systems that might be more suitable. Um, so for instance, um, I think the main point of bullet proofs is basically to say that if you have a very long statement, you can uh, apply these split and fold operations in order to, um, to shorten the proof length. And, um, and I think um, like for, for big intervals of range proofs, um, those would be a more valid choices. And similarly, SNARKs would be much more well suited for applications where uh, space or verifier time is critical. Um, so I think we need also need to have a discussion on what are the limits and when we want to adopt them. Um, um, also, another thing is that I think Sigma protocol would be very easy to prototype in the sense that it's a very small stack that you need to add to your implementation in order to have them. And, um, and I'll take this point again in a second. Um, but before then, I wanted to talk about post-quantum, um, also to partially reply to one of the reviewers. I think there are still nice properties that are preserved for uh, statements that are proven under Sigma protocols, even like 20 years, uh, when uh, perhaps we will be facing a, a quantum adversary. Um, this is mostly due to the work of Dominic, but essentially, if, uh, if we take a, a Schnorr proof, um, the zero knowledge experiment could still hold provided that the hash function is strong enough. So we're going to maintain- uh, so, Sorry, I didn't hear what, what experiment? The zero knowledge experiment, the security yes. game. Um, so we're going to preserve zero knowledge. And at least uh, I'm, I'm thinking right now about the simple Schnorr proof, I'm proving knowledge of a discrete log. Um, and, um, and I mean, with respect to soundness, well, I mean, the statement will become meaningless, but the proof will still be valid. This proof will still be sound. Um, so I think uh, even if in 20 years from now, you will be looking at a proof from, uh, from 20 years ago, there are still some security properties that are worth investigating, even if we're dealing with groups where the log could be easy faced to a quantum adversary. Um, is, that, okay. is that only really the case if you timestamp the proof and you assume that there were no quantum computers at the time that it was timestamped? Say it again? 
Is that only really true if you time stamped the proof and you assume that there weren't any quantum computers at the time it was time stamped? Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, otherwise, it's a, it's a difficult question because even otherwise, maybe the, the adversary was able to break discrete log, but the proof would be valid. I mean, as long as I'm proving um, the discrete log relation, uh, there is that solution. And uh, I mean, uh, there is only so much uh, you can fake about it. Yeah, the verification equation has that solution. Um, okay, so now. Yeah, and so, so on the usefulness of um, uh, Sigma protocols, we, we did actually consider using a, dis, um, a proof of discrete log equality, um, sort of blinded for Zcash. Um, and the, so the, the motivation of that would have been so that you could delegate to an untrusted prover, um, which you, you can't quite do without um, sort of uh, revealing your full viewing key to the prover at the moment. Um, and the reason we didn't include that is that um, basically because we'd have had to um, effectively standardize and, and do the engineering to work out how to um, to concretely do a, a discrete log equality proof. Um, and so if we had a standard, then we might have taken a different decision. Good to hear, thanks. Um, so now this is the point where if you think there are other, um, if you would like to push for a different kind of uh, um, limit, uh, I think maybe this is, uh, this is the time where I, I think, uh, I don't know, I thought it would be nice to chat together and see if, uh, if you had different opinion on that. I, I will add that um, this also seems to be kind of in, a, in, a, in sync with other existing working groups, right, Michelle? I mean, th this, this was a yeah. conversation that kind of originated last year, if I'm not mistaken, around the commit and proof discussion, right? Um, yeah, and uh, also there was the talk from Jan Kamenich that also mentioned explicitly right. Uh, that uh, uh, it's perhaps time to to get this standardized. Um, Definitely. Yeah. So, so to to me, the motivation would be if um, you can do a dis, um, uh, sigma protocol, uh, the prover being much more efficient than you can do a snark. Um, and it, so the, the comparison there would be against a snark with uh, untrusted setup um, because your sigma protocol is presumably with untrusted setup. But, but I mean, that uh, there would be the case like for a specific application of, of sigma protocol. I mean, there, there seemingly are others where it wouldn't be about replacing snark functionality necessarily. I mean, so, of course, so, you can always use a snark to uh, have a, 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 a to use a signal protocol with it. Um, I'm wondering, so I, like something like quite, privacy pass or something like that. I, I don't quite understand the point. Are you saying that there's functionality that you get with signal protocols that you can't do with the snark, or just the... no, no, no? That, so I, I I was correcting myself as I was saying that, but I think there are applications where potentially a signal protocol would be better off. Uh, I'll just jump in really That's, quickly. Um, so yeah. yeah, so there's efficiency uh, gains in Sigma protocols when you have a small number of witness elements over bulletproofs or snarks. Um, so I think as part of the standard, you can say basically, if the number of witness elements are small, here's roughly the size of the Sigma protocol. And then as the number of witness elements grows, here's where bulletproofs or snarks become more efficient. Thanks. So again, by way of uh, a contextualization within the broader ZK proof. Um, so we uh, started the uh, ZK proof uh, biting off the most uh, that we could in the sense of uh, going for 
succinct, uh, zero knowledge for general LP. And um, there is a recurring theme that this uh, presentation was a great example of, but maybe there are simpler cases that are important and even easier to standardize. So we should definitely uh, include them in scope, uh, not just in terms of its formal definition, but also in terms of the actual content of the program. So this is why uh, we were particularly excited about this proposal as a way to tackle Sigma protocols, which are crucial uh, if, uh, if both, both conceptually and uh, for deployed applications. Uh, so let me open up the question of uh, how do we integrate this discussion into uh, ZK proof in the most effective way, for example, do we integrate this as a dedicated section in the community reference or a subsection in the existing ones? Do we make this a separate uh, live document that is merely summarizing the community reference? And what should be the scope of what we standardize? Do we keep it at the level of uh, an informative discussion that highlights uh, pitfalls and considerations and provides a formalism? Do we strive to provide the next step of uh, actually prescribing specific schemes and reference implementations and test vectors? Uh, let's um, hear I, I, I think we need to know how much more complicated it would make the document if we tried to cover um, uh, Sigma protocols and CK SNARKs in the same document. Yeah, I mean, if we take the measure of uh, like Bonne Shoop, it's going to be like, uh, I don't know, one chapter. Um, how much is it? I tend to agree. I mean, if uh, if we want to get to the level of detail that is it's actually useful as, as some kind of reference or standard, it seems like it could be a self-standing uh, document. Um, I, I would say, though, that I do want us to maybe think about a few applications that we believe, uh, you know, as, as Chelsea said, that single protocols have an advantage over science. I mean, we, I mean, we have I'm... existing protocols like privacy pass, for example, that we could use as examples. I would actually say more than that, like a lot of the snarks that we have, especially the ones that don't have trusted setup are, um, based off this bulletproof approach where you have request of interaction, but that in my mind is a generalization of a Sigma protocol. Like it goes over many, many rounds, but so if we can get the standardization really sort of tight and this is how you do it for the Sigma protocol, then that will make it a lot easier if we start talking about how do we do snacks over discrete log groups. That, that's a very good point. If if for example, how you do hashing in Fiat Chamea, um, that is going to be similar between ZK Snarks and Sigma protocols, if, if not exactly the same, it, unless you want to be compatible with an existing proof system. I mean, having the Sigma protocols that we're using and the Snarks that we're using, using the same hash being compatible, the same curves and all the rest of it, that sounds wonderful to me. Yeah, that, that would go a long way to reducing the additional complexity for supporting um, Sigma protocols. Uh, and, and I think it would probably help um, the specification of the ZK SNARK side um, if we considered how to do that in both cases. It, it often helps if you generalize because you can see pitfalls that you might not have seen otherwise. Mm -hmm. So the, the idea would be like, um, you know, like in the in the Zcash specs, uh, you know, you have Dara the notion of uh, like a represented group, and then given a represented group, you have a a standard way of um, composing things. The idea would be to harmonize that across the Snark spec and the uh, this Schnorproof spec. Yeah, ideally, uh, and also the um, zk friendly primitive spec. I, I mean, uh, on that subject of represented groups, we, we got it wrong in, in Sapling because we intended to define a canonical representation and we ended up not. So um, the, there's, yeah, the detail matters. 
Did I say something? <clears throat> so um, I think that in my mind, as Mar Marie said, um, Indeed, bullet points are a generalization of this, so maybe it makes sense they're in the same family. And of course, it makes sense to make these SNARKs compatible. But for me, um, the fundamental and simpler application of, uh, of uh, Sigma protocols has been to prove knowledge of the discrete log and prove equality of discrete logarithms. And I think it would, it's like really sort of a failure if this is not some kind of standard, because this is like, everyday, super basic cryptographic. Yeah, the, there is a um, sort of a, a generalization of that um, discrete log equality um, proof where you're, you're proving linear relations and you can have more than one um, uh, equality or, or relation. Um, and that can be more efficient than doing separate proofs and then doing the and proof. Um, so it, it turns out that that's not much more complicated than a, um, a single discrete log equality proof. So we might want to standardize that and maybe no further. Yeah, I don't know. It's like, I, I think for sure, but what I, my point is that this should be somehow um, something that you can refer to, like these two relations. Of course, if you can get it more general, without um, being extremely complicated, that's that's better, right? But I think these two should be part of it somehow. Yeah, that, that generalization, by the way, was in the original Karen Stadler paper. I I do agree that those are, those seem to be from the Schnorr proof using systems that I'm aware of uh, what people want. Right, those are those are like the key uses of this construct. Whether it has whether generalizing it has uh, uh, more utility in our like overall standardization framework here or not, like we should we should make sure that we cover those. One thing that I probably would propose doing separately, however, if maybe still in the standards document, but certainly separately from this. It's, there was some discussion in the presentation about trying to make it something that's friendly to prove inside a snark, snark inside a circuit. And I think that the requirements that you have for something that you're proving inside a circuit are very different from the requirements that you have for something that you're not proving inside a circuit. And in particular, if you're wanting to, for example, hash down with Pedersen in order to fit, make things more efficient because you have a smaller input which you then put into Shara or whatever, then Pedersen is a lot less efficient outside of the circuit than Shara is. So that wouldn't be something that you would want to do in a system which you weren't proving inside zero knowledge. So I would probably choose to keep those separate. I, I mean, I think, so if, if you choose something like Poseidon, for example, then it's reasonably efficient both inside and outside the circuit. Um, but uh, that's not been standardized, really. We we should standardize it. <laughs> it's, it because um, I, I think the people are becoming more confident in using it. I mean, we're, we're using it in Orchard, which is the next um, uh, upgrade with Zcash. Um, and I think Filecoin are using it. Um, there's quite a lot of deployed projects are using it. Um, Mina, I think. One thing to mention is that maybe among possible applications is our, is threshold cryptography. Um, this is a this is a point where I will be getting to in a sec. But uh, like um, yeah, I'm I'm very happy with all these uh, these inputs. So um, I don't know if anybody else has uh, other points. Yeah, um, one thing I'm, I'm interested in the the domain separation idea. So, so first off, I, I think a question I, I didn't fully understand uh, when you were hashing in uh, various things for doing it properly. Why you had uh, a domain separator and uh, these different things, the instance of the problem and uh, the the curve being used and so on. Um, isn't that the role of the domain separator already? Um, maybe I misunderstood the, the purpose there. 
Um, it could be. Um, my point there was that if I if my domain separator is meant to say that uh, I'm proving uh, uh, the discrete log of uh, my passport key, uh, that is tied to passport proofs, and that is tied to um, some specific application. Um, other application, the the same um, the same domain might choose to use different generators at some later point in time, and you wouldn't want the two to clash. Right. That this is also, I, th I think there's a possibility of kind of, um, if you have um, constants in your circuit that um, are, are unexplained in some sense, you, you can gerrymander those constants so that um, you can break soundness if you don't hash the circuit. Depending on the proof system. Okay. Okay. Um, thanks for the point. So one one thing I wanted to to say is I'm interested in maybe getting a a standardization of um, how to use domain separators in the first place, because I'm not sure anyone uh, really knows what to use as their domain separators. And it, it might be useful to just have a registry of uh, a registry of values and just make sure that people don't step on each other's toes accidentally, because there's there's obviously sort of dual constraints that on the one hand these should be as short as possible, but on the other hand, the longer they are, the uh, easier it is to guarantee uniqueness. I'm I'm a fan of just using a domain name string and then colon and then a, a protocol specific thing, um, and that should be unique. Um, that that's what we're using. So the, there's a hashing to elliptic curves um, internet draft, um, which mm -hmm. has a, a big security section on domain separators, um, and maybe we can crib some of that, or, or even just use exactly the same format. Um, but to yeah. follow up on, on, on this point, on, on computing the challenge, um, one problem that I've been thinking about is if we try, as uh, Carla, Mary already, um, already mentioned, to, to have something that generalizes and goes up to bulletproof. Um, so the main reason why I, I, I think the strobe idea was inappropriate is that I don't want to bring the whole strobe stack to uh, something that should be simple. Um, but in something more complicated where you have multiple rounds, then it could be something that is uh, indeed um, usable. And um, I don't know, what are your thoughts on this? Um, I, I mean, is, is strobe that complex if you specialize it to spawn number of rounds? And... No, but at that point you have to base yourself on a sponge function, no? Um, I, I think most people, so most people who are using um, circuit efficient hashes are using them as sponges. My, that's my impression. And recently defined hash functions like um, uh, Blake 2 and Ketchak or, or SHA 3 and um, uh, Blake 3 are sponges. So it, it seems just like everyone's using sponges now. Okay. Um, so now if you like, I, I have a couple more points that maybe could spin the discussion. I don't know. Um, I'll leave just one second if you want to talk before continuing. Um, I would like to make sure that we leave time uh, for the actionable decisions. Um, do your additional points reflect on those or these elaborations? Yeah, um, it's going to be five minutes and then we can take the last five minutes on action. Points. Okay, great. Go ahead. Um, so, um, um, is, I, is the, yeah. uh, is, is the goal to just have one hash function? Um, cause, uh, as Mary said, uh, it seems that at at the least like two would be better like one for uh snarks and one for kind of people who aren't using uh, them in a snark context 
yeah, I think uh, the idea would be to have, uh, ideally I would like to have one in the SNARK context and one outside, one like uh, Asha3 or Blake2 or Blake3. I, um, I, I'm not sure that in the SNARK context, um, we would want to be that specific because although I said that people are gaining more confidence in Poseidon, yeah. Um, it, it, tomorrow, someone could publish a paper breaking it. Um, we're, hey, we're not also... that confident in it. Oh, sorry, lagging a little, I think. Um, I agree, uh, but I think we can also just accept to. Um... Oops. So, Anthony is asking on the chat a great question. Is the plan of the standardization to meet some security target or to interoperate to use Sigma protocols across many contexts? If the goal is the latter, we should be focusing on data encoding and defining domains, code domains of the functions. I would say both. Yeah. Um, I think that the, the, the most important point is the first one, but we don't want to close up on the second one, especially because we are. Uh, trying to maintain an entire ecosystem, and we would like to have this forward. I missed a comment from George, but to uh, reply to, uh, I forgot, never mind. Um, okay. Uh, I, what just, what were you saying, George? Misattributed, I would say not, I would say both oh. was said by Daniel, not by Anthony. Right, I was going to say that Dara's argument about not over-specializing um, due to the rapidly changing efficiency notions of the SNARK ecosystem uh, also applies outside of it, right? Uh, people, people deploy uh, Sigma protocols in the context of some other system that perhaps already uses SHA-2 or Blake-2 or whatever, and they're not going to be happy about having to pull in a Poseidon implementation just because we say it's good. Very good. Yeah. Um, but they I, did raise the consideration that uh, in a particular situation where a, an off-the-shelf standardized standard would have been useful if it had the right properties, there was none and that was a barrier. So I wonder if there's some way to do both, to give some kind of default reference that everybody's comfortable with while not mandating its use. Yeah, I mean, just recommend a particular hash function and that seems entirely reasonable to me. As well as mm -hmm. ideally the encoding, the main separation, etc. Yeah. Okay. Let, let's take this out to um, a working group, perhaps. Um, so I, I just want let I just wanted to like uh, illustrate a couple other points so that we don't don't just focus on how to pick a hash function. Um, so um, I mean. The way that I see Sigma protocols is that they have a very, as I mentioned before, they have a, a very simple overhead and they can be very, they are stable, like they are that thing and they are easy to deploy. It. Um, and um, the one thing that would be really nice, at least in my personal opinion, is that implementers could have a very, um, a good incentive into adopting Sigma protocols and then switch to another proof system at a later point wherever things might get more complicated, or at least have an interface for communicating interchangeably between Sigma protocols and other proof system. Um, so um, this is the reason for the first point, R1CS compatibility. I know that there have been previous efforts in this uh, uh, like entire community about making uh, uh, uniform file formats for R1CS. Um, and that there are even implementations like uh, ZKP that have the same API as Bellman, or at least they are inspired from that, uh, which uh, deals about uh, SNARKs. Um, but I also remember Dara, for instance, at some point said that R1CS is not necessarily the right format. Um, what I would like also to understand, uh, talking to people, is uh, what do you use in practice and what could be used as a common interface for talking to other proof systems, uh, so that you just have to replace uh, one function call and then everything is it. Um, I mean, so if we have, as an example, the same statement as we are proving with the Sigma protocol um, uh, as a, um, a SNARK example, then that gives people an easy migration from one to the other if they need to generalize. Yeah. And um, so the second point is uh, about share proof computation. 
that is also, I think, what was mentioned by uh, Carla. Um, so now I'm going to use a bit of an improper language, but for sake of abstraction, um, there are other efforts in uh, that are about sharing computation, sharing the generation of a proof between multiple parties that that have part of the witness. And I'm thinking about new SIG or Frost that are actually signature schemes. And um, even Thursday, Elet um, will present about distributed zero knowledge. And uh, definitely this talk, you shouldn't miss it if you will, are interested in this subject. But um, like the, the question is also whether we should have these included. We should make space in a standard for, uh, for these kind of extensions that are very appealing or that seem very appealing already in the context of signatures. And um, it is a possibility there will be also in zero knowledge. Um, one, uh, another point is about designated verifier proofs. And um, uh, there is also I'm one proposal that uh, we would need to delay this discussion in order to form the working group where this discussion can happen of this and many other points. Um, so being cognizant of time, uh, let's keep this for later and talk about how do we proceed from here? Yeah, okay. Uh... So if I may summarize, it, look like, it looks like there is tremendous interest uh, from the people in this discussion uh, in, in a real need. Uh, and of course, uh, as Michelle made a very strong case, uh, um, mistakes made that uh, maybe could have been avoided by having these kind of references and ideally uh, concrete standards. So this is within the scope of ZK proof. There are strong feelings that action is needed and there seems to be willingness to do it. So let's go for it. And I suggest that uh, the most natural way to do it is as a separate document from the community reference, because enough of the setting is different that trying to harmonize the two would be burdensome at this point. And that separate document, I think, can start from the current proposal. It's, it's an excellent starting point, and we definitely need to discuss how it needs to be extended. And um, um, let's uh, then find opportunities within the community reference to allude to it. Clearly, we want, want to add a succinct discussion within the community reference about the existence of such specialized proof systems and the applications for which they are pertinent and how at the high level they compare to general purpose uh, ZKPs for NP. And later on uh, in the part of the community reference that discusses techniques, we can likewise say, if you want to understand the HMEER, here's a simpler setting and refer to that separate doc. Um, and that would be um, a, something that the ZKP community reference editors would, happy, would be happy to uh, help coordinate. But just thinking about the uh, value creation for the Sigma protocols, uh, it's proposed that we create a working group. Uh, Michelle, you can create a Telegram channel to coordinate that, set up a meeting uh, within a couple of weeks or so. Um, and uh, let's decide that scope and um, uh, elaborate on the, the specifics like do we want to propose uh, concrete hash functions and by what criteria, as well as uh, visiting the lingering point we didn't get to? Okay, um, everyone? I, at least to me, it sounds very good. I also noted down uh, the people that uh, talked, so I'm going to hustle them and ask and keep them updated on this. Um, mm -hmm. And also, like, if you didn't talk, my email is, like, right there at the bottom. Uh, so please feel free to drop me an email if you don't use Telegram, if you would like to be added on there, and um, we'll take this offline. That's, uh, <laughs> that's all for me. Okay, so uh, Michelle and Stefan, uh, please take lead on creating the Telegram group, yeah. add the link to the, to the notes. We will circulate our reminders to everybody. Um, at the end of the workshop, so everybody can join the groups. And uh, I look forward to continuing the discussion. Thank you again for the submission. Thank you. Thank you again, uh, Michelle and Stefan. Uh, just one last comment before we wrap up. I would say uh, we need to be cognizant of other standards or other efforts that exist to standardize that are interacting with this. Uh, I think uh, Chelsea mentioned one, but there's also privacy pass if we're going to have some kind of interaction with that application and, and the committee proof in, in ZK proof. So let's make sure there is a part of the discussion around this as well. How not to just, uh, you know, uh, reinvent the wheel or try to take over other efforts. Um, 
And uh, with that, uh, unless there is any last comments by anyone. Uh, I'll, say, I'll say one quick last comment. Um, yeah, I think the please. fully generalized case is really interesting and we're not doing that. We're just doing signatures. Um, so happy to talk about that for anyone who's interested in doing sort of um, fully generalized proofs. And I do look forward to the talk on Thursday. Great. Thanks, Justin.